80% of them are Kalaks. So between ourselves and the Kalak population, we constitute 90% of the population. And all of us have to teach and learn in other people's languages. In foreign language, and it has created certain pressures for us. And that's what we are reviewing quite strongly. It affects our teaching, our learning outcomes, but it has also quite a number of psych psychological issues in terms of self-esteem, self-respect. So we're already looking at mother tongue based education as was recommended by UNESCO and gradually uh, changing our policies to make sure that they are indeed suitable for the majority of people in this country because currently it's just not working. As I say, we speak and, <laughs> and teach in the languages of our colonialists. So it has its own problems. So we have a number of programs that we are doing. Currently we are introducing a foreign language too early. And that's why, so after three years, then we swap from African languages to a foreign language before our kids can develop cognitively. So we're going to phase that we have a later uh, uh, introduction as a way of phasing in, but finally we'd like to really have mother tongue based education. So it's one of the issues that we're doing. Uh, in terms of recruitment, again, because our country is very diverse, we're really looking at recruiting even in areas of origin. Uh, so that we don't expect kids who were recruited in, grew up in urban, urban areas, uh, recruited in urban areas, then say when teaching rural areas. So we are, and it's working for other areas where we go and recruit, give incentives, give bursaries for people who come in those areas. And they find Fine. that they're able to operate and function in those areas where they've come from without necessarily locking them into those areas. But it's working better because then we don't have to encourage people to go and teach in rural areas, is to give kids who come from those communities areas. And just have community recruitment programs uh, and using communities also to really mobilize, like you would have teacher assistants and I think themselves begin to either have a teaching back ah. when they feel that that's the right place for them and are ready to stay, or just feel that I, it's not my place and they're able to leave. So, yeah, so we're also looking at quite strongly on inclusive education. So one area we're not doing very well, so that even our teacher development programs look at in inclusive education, especially in the earlier grades where we have to do early identification, early stimulation. So working with higher education is also to strengthen our hand with the teachers in terms of inclusive education. So maybe I should stop there. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Minister. And uh, I think uh, this is um... it's important, I think, for all the audience to, to know more about uh, how these uh, reforms are being implemented and, and uh, the results that you are achieving in this context. Um, South, South Africa, Africa has, has, and you, you, you mentioned, mentioned that, that has set up uh, incentives to address this disparity, disparity across regions, uh, rural versus uh, urban uh, or so uh, areas. The country like China has also uh, has done similar exercise, and uh, we have a video from Mr. Jai Wong. Uh, Vice Minister of Education in China, who's also uh, presenting with how China approached this issue of teacher shortages, elevating the, the status of teaching profession, in particular, balancing the needs between the highly developed urban landscape and the more remote and rural regions, ensuring that teachers' uh, needs are fully addressed. And we will uh, listen to the video and see the video, please. Xiaoxiu 作为科技领域的关键支撑
，将中华民族传统文化的思想精髓与新一代教育改革发展的生动实践相结合，赋予了人民教师崇高使命。当前，中国正在加速推进教育强国建设。中国政府将教育建设作为建设教育强国最重要的基础工作来抓。下面我重点分享下中国政府解决教育短缺难题的做法：一是夯实教育培养体系，不断健全中国特色高水平教育体系。目前，中国已建立了以两百多所师范院校为主体。近六百所非师范院校共同参与的中国特色教师教育体系，旗下有中师师、专科、本科、向专科、本科、研究生、三级教师教,教育留学生。国家层面实施了一系列项目，引领地方培养高素质教师，实施教育部直属师范大学师范区公费教育，共计招收十七点八万人。百分之九十的毕业生到中西西部任教，安排五十亿元支持师范院校建设，实施中西部欠发大地区优秀教师定向培养计划，每年为屏东县、中西部陆地边界县培养大约一万名师范生，依托高水平师范大学，支持薄弱地方师范院校建设，支持双方又建设高校。中小学培养研究生层次优秀教师，二是注重教学补充配备，适时为各类教育注入优质师资，服务义务教育优质均衡发展，学前教育普惠发展，高等教育多样化发展需要，每年为中小学、幼儿园补充教师约五十万人，着重补充道德与法治、体育健康、科学。信息科技、医疗、劳动、经济健康、特殊教育、警觉学科教育，每年为职业院校补充教师约九万人，着重补充双职型教师；每年为高等学校补充教师约四万人，着重补充高层次青年人。三是着力解决欠发达地区师资紧缺难题，促进教育均衡化。二零零六年启动实施普通义务教育阶段学校教师特色岗位计划，累计为中西部农村学校补充一百一十五万名教师，改善了村村教师队伍的整体结构，选派丰富省份二百四十七位高中阶段校长和两千余名教师，赴西部一百六十个国家乡村振兴重点帮扶县。帮助每县建好一所普通高中和一所职业高中，积极应对人口老龄化趋势，建构足够两万余名中小学退休教师和一千五百余名高校退休教师，前往中西部及农村地区开展支教支援。在此基础上，二零二三年启动实施国家引领教师启动计划，分类实施引领教师支持高等教育。职业教育、基础教育、终生教育、民办教育五大体系，建立引导带薪机制，强化教师群体带薪制度，引导引领教师为教育班级做出新贡献。四是加大教师培训力度，为教师专业发展创造更多的机会。实施中小学教师国家的培训计划，累计投入两百亿元。培训校长、教师一千八百多万人次，实施职教国培示范项目，建设一百七十个职教双实行教师培训基地和两百零二家企业实践基地，不断强化高校教师发展体系建设，每年支持五百名中西部高校青年骨干教师国内访学，促进教师数字化学习。在国家智慧教育公共服务平台建成教师研修板块，一千六百余万教师注册学习，提升教师数字化素养，先后实施两轮全国中小学教师信息技术应用能力提升工程。五是强化教师待遇保障，持续提升教师地位和职业吸引力。
，基本实现义务教育教师平均工资收入不低于当地公务员平均工资收入水平，完善中小学教师收入分配激励机制，绩效工资发放有效体现教师工作量和工作成绩。二零一三年以来，全面实施乡村教师生活补助政策，安排二百五十点一亿元，惠及中西部二十二省份七百二十五个区县，七点六万所乡村学校的一百三十万教师，加强面向教师供应的保障性租赁住房建设，以建设筹集五百七十万套。实施边远艰苦地区乡村学校教师周转宿舍建设，已建成六十三点二万套，超过八十六点六万教师入住。女士们、先生们、朋友们，推动教师队伍建设需要各国加强交流合作。中国始终重视教师队伍建设的国际合作，深入参与教科文组织国际教师工作组合作机制。设立中非信托基金为非洲地区教师赋能，与教科文组织合作在华建设该组织二类中心、教师教育中心和教师教育教协，为发展中国家提供教师能力建设支持。去年，教科文组织大会通过在华设立国际 STEM 教育研究所的决议，中方将支持该中心建设发展。借助该平台开展 STEM 领域教师能力建设合作，我们愿与大家携手并进，共同推动解决全球教师短缺问题，开创更加和谐美好的教育未来。谢谢大家。Euh, différents pays dans différents contextes que d'arrêter, y compris au niveau national. Et de la profession, comment une euh, l'Union africaine agit euh, dans ce contexte? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Um, I don't know. There is free French and English now. <laughs> so, or Arabic. <laughs> Salam alaikum. Um, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for, for your, your question. Maybe before I, I answer that, I wanted to just react very quickly to what the Honorable Minister was saying about. Uh, about the uh, issue of uh, uh, mother tongue education. Uh, why I wanted to react to this? Because I was, I was asked the question by some ministers when I was presenting the, uh, the theme of the year in a couple of, uh, couple of uh, weeks back. And uh, it is coming more and more uh, in, in the discussions and of course, we all know the recommendations of UNESCO, which is there for a long time now, that uh, it is always better to start with uh, teaching or educating the, the children uh, using the, the mother tongue. I mean, uh, a, a great uh, African expert with uh, Joseph Kizerbo, whom you always know, uh, says that uh, there are three elements in uh, edu education of uh, a kid. The first one is the sound. The second one is the meaning, the word. And the third one is the sign, the writing. So when you take a child whose education was first given by the, the mother and his community, he already masters the sound and he masters the meaning, because he masters the word. So it is very easy to make him competent just by teaching him how to write. Of course, 
this is true as long as when he goes to the school, there is a continuum between what he learned at home and what he is going to learn at school, what he hears at home, and what he hears at school. Unfortunately, in the majority of our countries in Africa, when the child is confronted to the school, he becomes a foreigner or he is aggressed because he is just exposed to a completely foreign language that he has to learn the sounds which are sometimes very different. You know, uh, if he speaks in Debele, he will not be able to, to speak French properly or English properly and, and so on and so forth. So my question here is, is a question and uh, because it's a forum, so I'm taking advantage to, to, to raise this issue is how, because then it implies if we want to go that way, which probably at one, one point or another, we will have to go that way. What are the conditions to make sure that if we reform, to, to transform education that way, we will succeed? Because it takes a lot of efforts. It takes adapting the, the, the pedagogic tools. It takes also retraining our teachers to, che to teach through the mother tongue. It may not be as easy as it seems uh, apparently. So I will stop there, but I just because we are in a forum, I, I wanted to, to, to react to this honorable minister. And also I'm ready, I mean, as a commissioner of the African Union, if this issue was raised by a group of ministers that the African Union, and then also I'm sure that UNESCO, because they are the ones who promote that, that idea, we can work together to start at least some pilot experiences and to see how it goes, learn lessons, and then uh, uh, try to, 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 go, to go upscale. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm delighted to be here today to contribute to, to, to this uh, collective reflection on teaching profession and the ways and means of tackling the worldwide shortage of teachers from which Africa suffers far more than other regions with an estimated shortfall, we say 15 to 17 million of teachers. The, the fact uh, that this meeting is being held in this noble uh, land of South Africa is a signal that the organizers at UNESCO are aware of these issues and we can only congratulate them for this choice especially as this event comes barely a week after the 37th session of the African Union Summit held in Addis Ababa, which enshrined education as the theme of, of the year 2024. And also before I, I go, I want to, to thank, uh, take this opportunity to sincerely thank the government and the people of South Africa for the warm welcome extended to all of us. So this, this 14th edition, as we heard this morning also, it comes after the UN Secretary General's high level panel or, or a group uh, on the teaching profession delivered its report, which was ably presented by our colleague earlier on. And also this urgent appeal addressed to all of us. It was addressed, I quote, to governments, teachers organizations, employers, schools, universities, civil society, students, international financial institutions, and others to adopt the recommendation and transform the teaching profession into highly high level, highly qualified, well supported, adequately remunerated, and highly respected profession capable of guiding and promoting inclusive, effective, and relevant learning, end of quote. The, the, the very fact that the UN Secretary General has gone far, so far as to set up a high level group on the teaching profession proves that we have reached a critical threshold that absolutely must be corrected. I mean, he didn't bring uh, people to talk about the pilots in air companies. He brought people to talk about the teaching profession. This is very serious. I mean, the UN Secretary General who has to deal with all the crises in the world, with the UN Security Council meeting every other hour and, and focusing on this, it sends a very, very, very serious signal. 
Uh, and before I, I continue, the, the, the problems are very much similar in Africa. They are even with, with higher equity than, than in other places, just to, to, to answer. I would like first to pay tribute to all the teachers, teachers past and present throughout the world, without whom many of us, if not all of us, wouldn't be here now to devise about this subject. And as I was writing these notes, I was reminded with emotion, a dignified, courageous, and patriotic attitude of the teachers, particularly female teachers of my country, Algeria, who, defying like one man the death threat made against them by the armed Islamic groups in the 90s, ensured the kickoff of the school year throughout the country, including in remote areas. They just went on while they were threatened of being killed if they go and open the door of the schools, and they did it. And this is a high tribute that we can, they are very, our teachers are the most respectable individuals in the society. And sometimes they, they take it on their own uh, just to make sure that our kids are educated. So we must really pay respect and tribute to this profession. The, the, the motto of this forum is to dignify, diversify, and enhance the profession. I, I, I wish to, to, to focus only on the dignity, the dignifying aspect. In a, a, a recent article, uh, a man who, who contributed actually to the high-level high panel, uh, Howard Stevenson, recognizes three fundamental pillars for the dignity. And he adds that today's teacher workforce problems exist because in so many areas, these pillars of dignity have been progressively eroded. These three pillars are recognition, agency, and rights. Recognition, he, he, say, he says that dignity depends on the recognition of importance and value. For teachers, this means that working conditions that enable them to carry out their work in a manner consistent with their skills and professional judgment should be there. Recognition is not limited to material factors as we sometimes tend to think. Although, of course, remuneration and working conditions are tangible reflections of recognition. In the vast majority of countries, and it was already mentioned by uh, in the report, teachers are paid less than the average earnings of people with equivalent qualifications and their working condition are, uh, conditions are poor. In both, both these respects, it is clear that the already poor situation is worsening. Uh, many of the teachers, we all have examples in all our countries that sometimes teachers start with the, that profession, but a couple of months or, or years later, either they are doing something parallel, which is very bad for the, the time they are devoting to their profession, or they are just going to another another profession because they are better paid in going into the, the industrial sector, for instance, or the economic sector. I'm, I'm happy to mention here that despite our limited resources in the African Union, for some years now, we have organized an annual competition for the best teacher, recognizing the 10 best teachers in the continent, two from each sub-region with gender parity and offering an award of 10,000 to the winners. Beyond the award, for us, it's a way of expressing our gratitude to a professional body that is sometimes or perhaps often neglected. And I, I here can launch an appeal to, to, to support of, of this, uh, this uh, initiative. I know I'm taking a little bit more time, I will, I will go faster. And the, the teacher qualification framework was already mentioned, so I will not, uh, will not, will not go there. Uh, I want to also uh, uh, say a couple of words on agency, because 
teachers are subject to a growing number of instructions and increased supervision. I'm, I'm addressing you, the honorable minister and their ability to act in a way that recognizes their experience and professional skills is diminishing. In, in other words, their autonomy in, in when they are in the classroom is being eroded. And this is not conducive. This is not attracting for, for the teachers. Uh, environments where trust prevails are being replaced by systems based on distrust and the development of cultures of compliance with rules. And this is very important, and we see it in many countries in our in our continent. Then there is the right, the, the issue of the rights. Uh, the issue of the rights is just that if we don't have adequate individual and collective rights to both guarantee and protect the right of dignity as work at work, then the the, the profession is not attractive anymore. So these these long-standing global trends in the teaching profession. This is what led to the current staff shortages. And as I was saying, in Africa, more than everywhere. Uh, uh, and lastly, I would finish with the fact that was mentioned also earlier on, that we need a constant dialogue and strong union, strong teachers union brought to the table to discuss with the, the decision makers at any time is the most powerful leverage to make sure that the, the, the teaching profession is respected, is dignified, and is contributing to the welfare of the, 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 the country and the, the, the children. I will stop there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, the Commissioner Berhassin. It gives a very good transition to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Nancy Loreno Morocho in Big Blue. Imbilco, Deputy Minister of Education of Ecuador. Uh, uh, the commissioner just spoke about the dignification and the importance of agency uh, of teachers. He ended with the importance of the voice of teachers, uh, their participation in social dialogue, uh, the contribution of union, and the participation in the policy making. And I was, as I was saying earlier, nothing about teachers without teachers. And I know that Ecuador has been uh, leading a very important uh, um, initiative to involve teachers in the policy dialogue. Maybe you can share with us that perspective, uh, Vice Minister, please. Claro. Bueno, eh, estamos en representación del ministro, ¿no? Y efectivamente, quiero empezar diciéndoles, comentándoles a todos ustedes que soy docente. Y que eh, por ahí ya también dentro de lo que es el planteamiento de la política pública que se está impulsando en el país fue eh, eh, crear estas oportunidades que tenemos nosotros los docentes. Y docentes que hemos experimentado incluso desde el sector rural todas las necesidades que se van presentando en este caso a nivel de país. En el Ecuador han surgido grandes cambios y por eso inicio mi intervención eh, confesándoles de esto, no que soy docente. Eh, y ser maestra eh, me permite esta conciencia crítica y reflexionar y pensar también en mis pares. Pensar en que desde mi rol de docente ahora estoy en un cargo donde el desarrollo profesional educativo es fundamental. Entonces, ¿por qué? Porque hay que reconocer que todos los docentes somos sujetos de derechos y que el derecho máximo que debe primar, como lo dijo Carlos, es el derecho a la dignidad. Eso no es negociable. En este sentido, eh, las iniciativas que se están impulsando como país Eh, es a través de diferentes espacios donde se asegure y se garantice que en realidad la voz del docente y de la docente se esté escuchando en un espacio de igualdad y de equidad eh, donde todos y todas podamos participar. Por ejemplo, eh, la trascendencia que se ha dado, la transformación que se ha dado desde el rol del docente, ¿no es cierto?, es es clave. ¿Por qué? Porque nos ha permitido dignificar la carrera del docente. ¿En qué sentido? 
eh, si es que vamos al 2000, del, por tomar un ejemplo, del 2009 a acá en adelante, incluso en las condiciones laborales, en cuanto a salarios, ha surgido un cambio, un cambio trascendental por lo menos de un 50%. En este, eh, y también pensar en que todos los procesos de formación continua y de profesionalización para el cierre de brecha de conocimiento se van adaptando y no solamente enfocándonos en ciertos sectores, a todos por igual, docentes de sectores rurales, urbanos marginales, urbanos, pero también docentes de, eh, in, del intercultural bilingüe. Es decir, los procesos de formación continua, profesionalización, están dados para todos. ¿Qué nos permite esto? Esto nos permite lo que eh, Paulo Freire decía, ¿no? La educación no cambia el mundo. La educación cambia a las personas que van a cambiar el mundo. ¿Y quiénes son esas personas? Porque todas las personas que estamos aquí, ¿verdad?, Estamos aquí por un docente, estamos aquí porque tuvimos un maestro, una maestra que mar marcó en nuestra vida y logró el que nosotros, todos los que estamos pensando en educación, creamos, creamos y estemos seguros de que la educación genera la transformación social. Y es por eso que en el Ecuador estamos impulsando mucho el rol del docente de esta el rol, el rol del docente como aquella persona que va a lograr la transformación social en este contexto y escuchar al docente rural, por ejemplo, a través, a través de círculos de aprendizaje, en esta transición curricular que estamos empezando es fundamental para que, para que ellos no comenten cuáles son las principales necesidades, las problemáticas, aquellos hitos que desde su realidad se consideran para poder, para poder generar una transición curricular a competencias. Es decir, con, desde sus espacios, eh, y ya le he mencionado, rurales, urbano marginales, intercultural, bilingüe, se genera también cambio. ¿Cuáles son esas necesidades del contexto? Uno. Dos, pensar en que el docente sí es fundamental como actor principal en el entorno educativo. Sin embargo, también es importante toda la comunidad, sobre todo en el contexto en que actualmente está viviendo el Ecuador, un contexto de violencia, ¿no? donde necesitamos comunidades seguras. Entonces, el rol del docente va ya a, también a crear estas redes de protección social, ¿no es cierto?, donde comente eh, con la comunidad, con las familias, con los agentes que están de organizaciones gubernamentales y no gubernamentales a nivel local. La voz del docente es clave, ellos son los que nos transmiten. Y número tres, todo esto hay que sistematizar, hay que sacar las buenas prácticas que pasan en la localidad y hacerlo política pública. ¿Cómo lo vamos a lograr? En el Ecuador nosotros estamos trabajando estos 15 meses que quedan para 15 años en el planteamiento del Plan Nacional de Educación, donde uno de los ejes es la revalorización docente. Uno de esos ejes va a ser y va a constituirse como política pública en varios ámbitos. Bienestar profesional educativo, es decir, Docente sí, como prioridad, pero también los otros profesionales de la educación, como los psicólogos, los trabajadores sociales, los bibliotecarios que están en las instituciones educativas. Eh, número dos, carrera profesional. Ahí sí va el tema de salarios, el tema de eh, cuidado de equipos, el tema de escucharles a ellos cuáles son esas necesidades para poder nosotros sistematizar. Y número tres, la formación continua y profesionalización, es decir, hay que cerrar brechas. Eh, actualmente nosotros, por normativa, tenemos la responsabilidad del gobierno en formar y profesionalizar con un título de tercer nivel, lo denominamos allá, a todos los profesores bachilleres que tienen un nombramiento definitivo como eh, docente. 
Y de estos eh, nos quedan eh, 169 docentes por cerrar esta brecha. Pero así también otros programas que están dentro de eh, la carrera profesional. Y además que los cursos, eh, si bien es cierto, tenemos grandes oportunidades a través de la virtualidad, pero queremos humanizar estos espacios también. Es decir, hacerlos también eh, que yo me capacito, pero converso con mi par qué es lo importante que salió de acá a través de pautas metodológicas que le permitan tener al docente, a la docente, herramientas para la implementación. Y sobre todo en, este, en esta transición curricular, les comento, en abril eh, nosotros tenemos el mes de la revalorización docente por un gran maestro a nivel de país, Juan Montalvo, y se va a decretar en el Ecuador el mes de la revalorización docente, donde el docente en un escenario como este va a poder plantear también cuáles son los argumentos como política pública para mejorar el currículo nacional. Muchas gracias, ministra. And, uh, uh, honorable, um, muchas gracias. Honorable John and Tim Forger, Deputy Minister of General Education in Ghana. We just heard uh, the Vice Minister um, uh, of Education of Ecuador highlighting uh, among the uh, element of the dig dignification of the teaching profession, professional development, but uh, highlighting that teachers have to be that agent of change. They have to adapt to what uh, uh, the Vice Minister mentioned as the transition to curricula. We know that teachers have to cope with the more uh, global challenges like climate change, like environmental uh, issues, digital technology and, and uh, digitalization of education, education for peace and uh, for social cohesion. And the vice minister just mentioned also violence in schools. How Ghana is uh, reforming its um, teacher education to cope with those challenges? How are you leveraging technology to uh, contribute to addressing those challenges? Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chakron, um, Assistant General Secretary General of UNESCO, the Her Excellency Minister for Education, South Africa, Commissioner from AU, colleague ministers, and friends. I'm excited to be here. In Ghana, we recognize that if not something very urgent is not done to address the global shortages in teachers, consequently, we'll get to a situation where if there are no if there are no sufficient teachers to teach, then we'll have the countries and continents lacking critical mass with the requisite skills to transform their countries. And so in 2018, with the support of UNESCO and the Norwegian government, Ghana instituted and implemented comprehensive national teacher policy. That has brought a lot of transformation. Along with that policy is the implementation of the national teacher education curriculum framework, which repositioned how teachers are prepared before they are deployed to the classroom. So the concept of, of global change or sustainability, climate change of human rights, um, environmental degradation and ICT, AI-led education, all these have been infused into how teachers are prepared. And, 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 and so before they are done with their presets, they have the requisite skills to be able to prepare uh, people for the digital economy and people for the global economy. But along with that transformation also came with a deployment of laptops to all teachers when they are in service. Uh, since the past three years, we've seen the deployment, the supply of 280,000 laptops to each teacher free of charge from the government to aid their continuous professional development. In, in addition to that, the government has implemented through the National Teaching Council and with the support of TTEL in transforming our, uh, our teacher education, we have implemented a point-based continuous professional development program, which ensures that teachers, when they are in service, continually receive upgrading, partake in training, in workshops, and they themselves apply themselves to lifelong learning. And these points count for their promotion, also counts for their license renewal. And I must mention, that in Ghana, for the past five, six years, we've been implementing Ghana teacher licensure um, policy, which ensures that after the number of years of um, the teacher's training in the University or College of Education, you must set a certain test 
to meet the minimum standards to teach in Ghana and any parts of the world. But in all of these, in, in ensuring the dignity of the teacher is, uh, is, is attended to, we, we reformed the minimum qualification to teach in Ghana from the three-year diploma of, in education to a four-year bachelor of education degree. Now, that has implication even for compensation, because hitherto, if one starts with a diploma, they will start with a senior superintendent with a certain salary scale. It would take them about 10 years to get to a, a starting point where the newly graduated teachers in Ghana are starting. And, and in the past few years, um, last year, for instance, though Ghana at this point may not be able to boast as among the countries that have the teachers receiving the highest pay, we have made some strides towards teachers' welfare. Last year, we saw in 2023, we saw the teachers' salary increase to, in, in, um, we saw 30% increase in teachers' base salary. The first part of this year, we've seen 23% increment, and the second half of this year, from July to December, it is expected that teachers will receive 25% increase in their salary. So these are some of the strides we are making. It's, impo it's, it's important, I think I will let my president know that these are plus must call for more releases of funds for the teacher profession. And it's also important that at the outset, we attract, we attract some of the best, the best and brightest into the teaching profession. So one motivation we instituted is training allowances. So whilst that's very unique to teachers and nurses in our country. So whereas every other student in tertiary institution will be paying their fees and will now be supporting themselves, teachers who are being trained presets still receive allowances, stipends to support them whilst they are in school. So these are some of the interventions that we have put in place to ensure that the teacher is dignified. On the uh, valorizing side, we've instituted an annual recognition program that is the um, Ghana Teacher Prize that recognizes the most outstanding teacher with various categories. So the most outstanding teacher in Ghana gets to be built a three-bedroom house, any location of their choice. And the, and the second most outstanding receives an SUV vehicle and many other prizes for various categories. So these are some of the strides we are making to ensure we attract the best and retain them. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. You have created the fun club here. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, indicating those reforms uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the action that are taken by the government of Ghana to uh, dignify, valorize the profession and, and creating a, a career uh, development that is uh, attractive for all teachers. You also mentioned, I think, um, the importance of uh, international cooperation. You mentioned this project uh, that was funded by the uh, Norwegian um, uh, support and, and implemented together with UNESCO. Uh, earlier, the Vice Minister of uh, uh, Education in China mentioned the importance also of international cooperation. And I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Mario uh, Vesalainen, Senior Ministerial Advisor of Minister of Education and Culture in Finland, how do you see the international cooperation and, and support to education and teacher policies uh, through the lenses of the uh, international cooperation, please. Thank you, Mr. Kakrun. First of all, it's a great honor to be here and bring greetings from Finland and the Ministry of Education and Culture of Finland. Um, first, I wish to thank uh, UNESCO and the government of um, South Africa for organizing this very important event, and of course, DTF also. It's my honor and to attend as Finland is uh, an active member of the International uh, Task Force on Teachers. And we are currently also in, in its steering committee. I see that international networks they are very important for raising the status of teaching profession and sharing best, best, best practices. And as we are discussing teacher shortages, Finland uploads UNESCO's first ever global report on teachers. As we heard already today, 
44 million new teachers are needed to achieve the SDG 4 goal 2030. This is huge. The gap is roughly half size of the current teacher for workforce globally. I thank also UNESCO for sharing the, these highlights recently at the uh, Educa Fair event in Finland, which is the largest education event in the Nordics. More than 15,000 teachers and education experts attend the event annually. Broad-based discussions are really important and needed. Dear colleagues, professional well-being of teachers is the best way to combat, combat teacher shortages and ensure the attractiveness of the profession. In Finland, part of the solution is that teachers are valued and respected as pedagogical experts and also as experts in their field. Teacher education also needs to be continuous, continuously updated. Finnish teacher education is, teacher education is research based and of high quality. And this is one of the key reasons why we are able to put a lot of trust in teachers. They have a lot of professional autonomy in their work. Therefore, we are happy that UNESCO's executive board will soon start considering the possibility to renew UNESCO's normative instruments on teachers. It's crucial to elevate the status of teachers if we are able to tackle the learning crisis. Teachers must have agency in the development of their own work. Teachers should also be engaged in education and development more broadly. In Finland, teachers, also through their trade unions, are the single most important partner in education reform, policy or legislation. That is very important for us. Um, now to your question, <laughs> to be brief, international partners can do a lot. In case of Finland, education is a priority area in our development policy. Much of our bilateral and multilateral work covers efforts to strengthen teachers' capacities. For example, through the Global Partnership for Education and Education Cannot Wait funds. With CODES program, we are supporting the World Bank in piloting and scaling up good practices and effective models for teachers in service training. Finland is intensify, intensifying collaboration also with, with the EU, for example, as a consortium member of the regional teacher initiative in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm very happy that UNESCO and African Union are part of this initiative, which will kick off this year. I hope it will also support African Union's year of education and its roadmap. To add, we are proud to host UNICEF's uh, Global Learning Innovation Hub in Helsinki, and the hub provides an exciting opportunity to explore solutions in digital learning. We believe that technology can serve learning, but this needs to be based on evidence and research. And teachers must co be co-designers on technology and innovative developers of new pedagogical approaches. Finally, I think we need to strengthen the multi-stakeholder approach. Civil society, the private sector, and academia all can make an impact. And together we are stronger. We need all the sectors to cooperate. For example, the Finnish higher education institutions, together with partners from India, China, and Africa, Go, are co-creating research-based solutions to educational challenges through the Global Innovation Network for Teaching and Learning. This is uh, coordinated by the University of Helsinki and Jyväskylä. And through this network, more than 40 uh, partnerships have been established in Africa alone. 
and all projects have some focus on teacher education. Dear colleagues, to conclude, as we are pro proceeding towards the UN Summit uh, of the Future later this year and the UN Social Summit uh, next year, Finland faces to highlight the importance of the recommendations by the high-level panel on the teaching profession. We expect them to feed in the follow-up the of the Transforming Education Summit. Without competent, motivated, and supported teachers with high-quality teacher education, we cannot achieve inclusive quality education for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, have, a, again, a Mission Impossible 2 to summarize uh, uh, the discussion. But uh, I think uh, uh, as we get uh, into uh, country, concrete country cases, I think we have uh, identified some of the policy measures that can dignify, valorize, and diversify the teaching profession. One, uh, and is very clear, is equity in and through teachers and teacher education, how we ensure a better um, uh, allocation of teachers uh, and uh, address the disparities among uh, rural and, and urban, among these different regions that are affected by uh, the issue of teacher shortages. The second uh, is very clear is about how we valorize the working conditions, including the, uh, the wages, but not only, it's about also career development and, and professional development. And third is about the social dialogue and participation of teachers. And uh, last and not least, I think the last point is about how we advance this, the international cooperation and solidarity, how we share experience and knowledge, how we learn from each other, and then how we build a common and an international community that can advance as a G4, that can advance the right to education and advance it through the teaching profession as well as a collaborative profession. So thank you very much to all our eminent speakers. Thank you for this uh, very wonderful session. And over to my colleague to give some logistical um, information. Please, Carlos.